Hello. So um, I'm not Heather. I'm Gregory joining you from the UK just for a short bit. Um, Heather's getting ready because in half an hour there's the um, the community coffee about global OSM diversity and inclusion. So that will be in breakout room two if you're in the conference system for venueless. But here we're going to be watching the lightning talks, um, short talks. I'm not going to introduce each of them. We'll play them one after the other. And if there's conversation in the chat or questions, maybe I'll have a bit of time to mention those for people watching the live stream. So um, let's go and watch our first lightning talk. Hello, everyone. Myself, Arjun from OSM Kerala. Let us see how a boundary puzzle was been solved in Kerala. The, these are the boundary hierarchy followed in India. Administrative boundaries, political boundaries and local uh, government bodies uh, boundaries are three different broad categories of boundaries which we follow in India. State uh, is divided into district, div districts divided into taluk, taluks divided into village. Pa then political boundaries are assemblies and uh, parliament constituency where the local, uh, whereas the local bo uh, government bodies consist of municipal corporation mun uh, or municipalities the, or uh, Gram Panchayat or Block Panchayat then uh, or the District Panchayat. The general structure is uh, different uh, wards uh, combined to form the uh, uh, Gram Panchayat, different Gram Panchayat combined to form a Block Panchayat and uh, different Block Panchayat combined to form a District Panchayat. Uh, coming to the urban bodies, different wards directly form uh, municipalities or corporations. Why do they need maps, the uh, local uh, government? They need the boundary maps or the maps as they are the custodian of the assets for any infrastructure projects or the utility project uh, the panchayat or the municipality requires map they are the first respondents of uh, any hazard uh, without maps uh, it, it is almost impossible to respond uh, towards uh, any disasters maps and th these are the different uh, sources of maps and uh, and different uh, where, where we can obtain those in care india why are the uh, admin boundaries so important in order to uh, make the decentralization uh, effective, uh, we need a proper uh, map of administrative boundaries. Uh, this, uh, without a proper boundaries, it creates uh, ambiguity uh, to avail service from the government. The census, resource allocation, taxation, disaster management, etc., are uh, solely depending upon the administrative boundaries. Recently, the COVID-19 uh, restrictions also depended on these boundaries why are these uh, boundaries so complicated because they are highly dynamic in nature uh, at every five or ten years uh, the village the gram panchayat uh, gets reorganized due to the pol uh, population increase uh, socio and various other socio economic uh, and political reasons so as uh, the uh, gram panchayat uh, all other uh, government bodies uh, also get reorganized hence uh, entire uh, panchayat uh, or entire admin boundary is being uh, reorganized. The reorganization is uh, often ha happens like including or excluding some uh, sets of what to the bigger cluster. But in reality, what happens uh, is the uh, proper maps are uh, either not available with the local government or if available, it is in hard copy or in PDF or rarely in CAD format. The village organizations uh, will uh, reorganization will require uh, entire redrawing of the map due to this. Uh, the two administrative bodies uh, prepare, uh, uh, prepared map will not never match in the borders. Uh, they either overlaps or they just leave small gap between. The citizens uh, have very less uh, access to these uh, maps. Also, uh, different departments uh, among the government uh, they have different. They prepare their own maps and they are never matching. You can see uh, how pathetic the map was uh, before uh, OSM Kerala in intervened. Uh, on the left, you can see uh, the map of uh, Kurachundu village panchayat. And uh, after uh, intervening of uh, OSM uh, volunteers, uh, uh, you can see how the difference had happened. It all started from Kurachundu village panchayat in 2014. Uh, it was ever uh, the first ever uh, mapping party organized by a government body. 20 OSM volunteers uh, mapped the entire village uh, and village boundary. In 2016, where the Velur panchayat uh, mapping party also replicated the same model. In 2018, catastrophic flood hit Kerala. The disaster response team uh, formed a community mapping hot tasks were created. Uh, community reached out to uh, corporate mapping teams and uh, their focus was uh, changed to uh, Kerala for some days. 
uh, this all increased uh, or some activity in Kerala. In 2018, uh, Kurachandra Village Panchayat uh, Mapping Party version 2 was launched. Uh, 220 students uh, volunteers were trained uh, and uh, ma inspired from all this, uh, the state launched an event, Mapathon Kerala, where state uh, funded uh, and uh, trainers uh, for uh, channelizing volunteers to and training them to how to map in uh, OSR. These are our achievements. We completed uh, at the admin level 5, admin level 6 and admin level 8 uh, that is you can see uh, admin level 8 is 1034 uh, geometries. We applied for OSM grant 2020 and uh, for admin level 10 uh, the, nothing can bring down the spirit of the community in moving with their needs. 7 out of 14 districts were completely mapped uh, during this time. So this uh, we formed uh, open uh, open data Kerala was uh, formed and we released the uh, admin level eight uh, the panchayat village panchayat boundaries uh, in open license media the straight away started using the village boundaries uh, for the election visualizations covid uh, data visualizations we had direct uh, association with adat uh, panchayat trishur in collaboration with uh, institute indian institute of technology alakad uh, for puducherry mapping as the pandemic uh, changes the be its behavior the strategy uh, also uh, in managing the pandemic uh, changes nationwide lockdown uh, restrictions uh, transferred into local body level admin level eight boundaries of, were of great use during these times that is the village panchayat boundaries thank you Hello State of the Map, I'm Gregory and when the conference isn't on I've been running a small YouTube channel about OpenStreetMap. So I wanted to look and tell you what the OpenStreetMap community is like on YouTube um, if you're into watching videos because all the conference talks we trumpet most years end up on YouTube so there's a wealth of knowledge there. Check out the State of the Map channel for the last four years of those. Um, likewise, there's State of the Map US channel that puts it com its conference videos online. And Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, they've been putting videos online for nine years, clearly wanting to share that knowledge with as many people as possible, wherever they are. Um, and they also have two minute tutorials, which are really nice snappy bits about OpenStreetMap, you might learn something. Um, and I'll mention OpenStreetMap Austria, although most of their channels in German, they do have talks from State of the Map EU in 2018, which was in English. Um, and there's actually a load of YouTube channels in different languages beside English. So if, unlike me, you understand something else, um, search YouTube for your country and you might find something there. But I will mention OpenStreetMap Indonesia because they have over 2,000 subscribers. So although I don't understand their videos, um, there must be something good there. Maybe it's worth them hosting the international conference in a future year. Um, OpenStreetMap Brazil have done videos recently that seem to be tutorials, so not just conferences. And of course, there are lots of groups um, that don't host conferences, but places like OpenStreetMap India, their channel is actually in English, um, not Indian, so they've got lots of project videos, about an hour long, and um, I'm gonna go and watch some of those because they've only recently started, um, and I think it'll be interesting to see what's there. In the same way, OpenStreetMap Ireland have been, because of lockdown over the last year, they've not been able to have meetups, so they've been putting videos on their YouTube channel. Um, and MapGive in the US have recently restarted uploading videos and streams. They're kind of mapathons. So if you want to join people as you map, um, that's a good place to look. And Mapillary, a company um, that does street level imagery that you can upload. So their channels obviously focus on that specific part of OpenStreetMap and that tool, but some very good tutorials been uploaded there in the last seven years. Um, but that's enough about the organizations. What's really interesting on YouTube is the individuals that have been running YouTube channels. So I looked at those. There is, going away from English again briefly, there's one this translates, the name translates to OpenStreetMap and more. Um, 
so I don't understand, but they seem to be tutorials and discussions, and so if you understand Russian, you can probably uh, get some value out of that. Um, Bart Eisenberg has a channel. These seem to be quite nicely made tutorials about different phone apps. Um, he's got 15 videos up there already I want to look at. And then this channel actually inspired me to um, make this talk for the conference. It's OSM for History Buff over the last year. Anne Caroline in Ireland has been using her historian knowledge to add to OpenStreetMap, but to tell people how they can add things to OpenStreetMap, um, things that I wouldn't even think of mapping. She obviously thinks and she talks about how she finds these places and how she creates maps of historical information as well. Very good if that's your interest. Maybe you know someone who's not even a mapper, but they could use that. Um, yeah. And then, of course, there's also my channel I've been doing for three years, Mapper Diaries. Not really tutorials at all, but I've been having a bit of fun in the way teenagers don't play computer games anymore. They sit on YouTube watching others play computer games. So if you don't want to do any mapping, which I think would be very weird. You can watch me do mapping, kind of as if you were walking alongside me. Um, and I'll t I do talk a bit about projects like the USM UK Quarterly Project, but also the history. But yeah, that's a great set of channels out there. Have a look at them. Subscribe and like the ones that are worthwhile because it encourages me and the others to keep on making these videos for you. Hello, welcome. I'm Helga Tauscher from Dresden, Germany, where I work as a researcher, software developer at the Faculty of Spatial Information and in the field of construction informatics. Today, I want to introduce a project to you that started as a toy project during this pandemic when I wanted to create a nice space to meet with family and friends. To begin with, I have created a map of my favorite island for work adventure. This is Regan Island in the north uh, of Germany in the Baltic Sea. To those who don't know work adventure, it is a so-called spatial chat tool or ad hoc video conferencing tool. You move around the map with an avatar and as soon as two avatars approach each other, they establish a Jitsi meeting and can see their video and hear their audio. I have at first created this map with a with D tile editor using the send tile set from Open Game Art. This map that you see here is basically a grid with each cell assigned exactly one tile from the tile set. Then after a while I thought, hmm, why not use geospatial data or other real world data to inform the map? Well, said and done, here is the OpenStreetMap relation of our island and I had to collect the bits and pieces and then uh, simplify the polygon before I could map it to a tile set. So for the um, collection of the pieces and simplification, I used the polygon servers of the French uh, OpenStreetMap group this service combines the segments of a relation polygon or multi-polygon and optionally applies Douglas Poika and uh, sampling to a fixed grid. This is used as uh, implemented in PostGIS through the respective functions. Um, we don't use the sampling from the polygon service, but apply our own sampling procedures to determine intersections of the polygon with grid lines. We throw away the information about the shape in between grid line crossings and derive a signature um, for each cell. So these signatures basically consist of the topology of polygon segments um, that are crossing the particular cell. And these signatures are straightforward to map to a tile set. 
For example, these five cells have the same signature, and given the send tile set, um, they would map to this particular tile. So as a result, from the polygon, we get a two-dimensional index into the tile set. Here you see um, a map of Rügen Island with a different tile set. So we have applied the algorithm to various uh, selected islands of different shape and size and created work adventure maps um, from their outlines. Those um, islands and um, links to the work adventure maps can be found on a dedicated GitHub page. And we also have the Python scripts um, on GitHub. There are a variety of ideas for improvements um, in my mind. So, for example, the send tile set needs extension. Um, it would be nice to have an island hopping map, um, which could provide navigation between different islands. Um, we could also treat archipelagos as groups and add further features to the map, for example, settlements. Um, also, the coastline simplification could be improved in various ways. So, to close up, I want to um, again credit the OpenStreetMap contributors and um, the creators of the Sand Tile Set. If you like the project, um, follow along or even contribute. Um, we plan a little survey further down the road and would we'll be glad about participation. For now, I thank you for your attention. Hi, everybody. I'm Ivan Sanchez, and I'm going to talk about experiments on peer to peer tiles very briefly. This is something I have uh, done recently just to see if it's possible. Now, you have to keep in mind that I'm kind of an OpenStreetMap old timer. I have been involved in OpenStreetMap in the first years of the project, but lately I have gone a bit apart of OpenStreet from OpenStreetMap, and I have moved into the software side of things, going especially into Leaflet and lots of crazy JavaScript. So I used to know how the tile server and caching mechanism works and the, roughly how the system's architecture of OpenStreetMap worked. I kind of not do that anymore. Still, I can do weird things with JavaScript. One of the things I have been playing is WebRTC. It's a technology that it's used to exchange data between web browsers without going through a web server. You know, to do that, you need uh, a bit of um, extra technology, which is uh, in uh, web RPS jargon, a signaling server and something called Stun and Turn servers. But the basic mechanism is that given a web server that with JavaScript tells the browser what to do, that browser connects to a signaling server and then finds another browser to talk to, and then the browsers talk between themselves within, without exchanging data with the web server. So I thought, can this be used to lighten the load on the tile servers? Maybe it's a good idea. So the whole process should be like this. Uh, there's a web page with a lot of JavaScript, plus leaflet or open layers or whatever JavaScript map client you want. There's also a signaling server which will uh, connect your browser with a different browser. And then one of the browsers requests the tiles, and that browser can spread the tiles along all the connected peers. So is this possible at all? Well, let's see, because I have, I'm going to make a live demo. But wait, this is a pretty cold talk. So I'm going to ask Ivan from the future to copy paste in the conference chat right now a link to the working proof of concept. Now, keep in mind this is experimental and might fail due to network topology or whatever causes. But let's see it. So right, right now, I have two browsers which are in the same computer, which technically means it's uh, it, they are in the same local network. I'm going to advertise myself a couple of times, and I'm going to ask for peers a couple of times, and I'm going to advertise, ask for peers. So I have now several connections between the two browsers. So when I zoom in into this map, the other browser is going to get requests for the tiles. It cannot fulfill them, so the first browser is going to fall back to the network here to fetch the tiles. Now, when the second browser zooms in, these tiles are being cached from the first browser, and there is no network requests whatsoever at that point. So you can see I'm, I'm getting some advertisements and some connection between browsers, but there are no tiles being fetched from the network. Okay? In this one browser, you can see the tiles being requested from the network, but if I 
cache them in the second browser and then the first browser requests them, there is no tiles being asked from the network here. So it works. And there's a lot of things that should be finished before making this kind of useful and public and you know, pulling into production. I don't have time for it, so I will just leave this here. Now, is the tech Bible? I think it is. Is it useful for OSMF and for actually distributing OpenStreetMap map tiles and maybe perhaps changing the tile policy or allowing more clients to use OpenStreetMap tiles? I'm not so sure because first, there's a lot of unresolved concerns here. And second, I talked briefly with one of the, with Paul Norman from the OSM tech uh, team, and I'm not really convinced that peer-to-peer -peer tiles are a necessity right now. Maybe in the future, maybe it's an idea worth exploring, but right now, it will not help much, unfortunately. So that's all I have. That's all I wanted to tell. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to follow up on them. Just write me an email or visit my webpage for contact details. I hope to see you soon in some of those state of map conference. Bye. Hello everyone, my name is Marcel Reinmuth. I am a research associate with the Heidelberg Institute for Geoinformation Technology and I will be talking about the Open Healthcare Access Map. This is a project or rather a web application we worked on the last couple of months. Um, first a bit about the motivation. Probably most of you heard um, about um, sustainable development goals and if you scroll through some of the indicators and underlying targets, um, you quite often see the phrase access to. Access to free primary education or in the case of healthcare, access to reproductive healthcare services or universal healthcare. We are here at Highgate search for how can we use open data and by that I mean heavily open street map and open methods to measure such access. How can we measure progress um, towards these goals at different scales? And the web application I show you now is a try to do that. Um, so let's give it a try. This is the open healthcare access map. This is our landing page. The area of the unit of analysis is for now always countries and we already processed some and others will follow soon. Let's take the example of Uganda. This is the country view. We see some controls on the left here in the top and some chart and some numbers and of course a map. And here the different areas, they depict um, areas of travel time. So all the yellow areas um, within there, the travel time is 10 minutes or less, all the green ones 20 or less. And this is up to an interval of greater 60 minutes. And right now we look at access towards primary care facilities. We differentiate also um, into secondary and tertiary and a blend of both. Um, please have a look at the method tab. There you can see the different, how, how did we align classes here, the type of facility and, and text. Um, we also have different scales of interest. For now, this is national, so just continuously. Um, travel times. Um, we also have aggregations for the first administrative level. For Uganda, this is four units here. And we see also here the share of population is distributed into these 10 minute intervals. Um, and we also have another aggregation level layer. Um, this is hexagons. So hexagons is a bit more meaningful if you compare countries because the administrative first level is quite arbitrary. Um, here we see for Uganda, we see um, a high share of accessibility um, in almost all of the country except for the northeastern. But again, this is just according to our analysis and of course um, the data we used. Um, let's head back to the slides. Okay, so what is the method behind um, that accessibility areas, these estimates you saw, these are based on the open root service. This is a um, routing engine software developed here at Highgate. There's also a public API. And we use this engine to create isochrones. There's an endpoint for that. An isochrone is basically the area I can reach 
from a certain location in a certain amount of time. We did a bit of processing, created intervals, extracted population counts. Important to say about open root service is there are different profiles of mobility. We used car, so everything on the web application is motorized travel um, for now, but there are also possibilities to do um, walking travel or bike travel. So what is the outlook for the project? We see a need to better explain how the data is created, um, what's the nature of the data, how, how did it get that distributed across a country. And we think about, or we want to address that by linking in other Highgate services. For instance, there's the Awesome History Explorer, where you can search um, among different themes, um, how the data was created in different hexagons globally. There's also the Awesome Quality Analyst. This is an application that combines intrinsic and extrinsic indicators on completeness and quality. And of course, we need to collect more feedback and further requirements from the healthcare sector, how such a um, web application can have an impact on healthcare planning. And well, that was my lightning talk. I hope I got you excited. Please try out the web application and leave me some feedback via email or here during the conference. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, my fellow mappers and OSM enthusiasts. Um, welcome to my five minutes of state of the map lightning talk about uh, unclassified roads and why I dislike them and why I think they need to go. Um, we need fewer road classes in OSM and I'm going to spend the next four minutes and X seconds talking about why I think that's neat, that is the case. My name is Martijn. I'm from the United States. I'm from the Netherlands, actually. And, but I've been in the United States for the past 10 years. I'm mapping a lot there, meeting a lot of other mappers, um, and also working on a project called MapRoulette, uh, which I'm going to do a workshop about uh, at this state of the map as well. So look that up if you're interested in learning more about uh, MapRoulette. So meeting new mappers and other mappers, uh, the same types of questions about, about road types and road classification come up quite a lot. Uh, questions like this, what makes a trunk different from a motorway? Is a residential more important than unclassified? Are state highways always primary? And these are questions that are sometimes hard to answer, but they point to a level of confusion about uh, road types and how to, how to classify roads and distinguish them from one another. And to, me, to my mind, that's a clear indication that we have too many of them and that we could uh, do with uh, fewer. If you look at the wiki, there are actually, in terms of main road, road types for, for cars, uh, there's seven, right? Motorway, trunk, primary, secondary, tertiary, unclassified, and residential. And um, that's more types than most other maps have. Uh, if you look, for example, at Waze, they only have five types. They have freeway, major highway, minor highway, primary street, and street. And uh, what's interesting about st that street type, the bottom one, the least important one, is that um, it's basically defined as any street that's not one of the other types. So it's basically negatively defined as something, as a bucket category. Um, it doesn't meet the criteria for anything else. So I think for OSM, we could do something similar instead of having unclassified and residential separately, we could just have one type that is street. Look what happens if you try and map the two, if you try and map the OSM classes onto uh, what Waze has, right? Motorway is, is straightforward. Motorway and OSM is a freeway on Waze. Um, a primary road is a major highway in Waze. A secondary is a minor highway. Tertiary is a primary street. And then residential is basically what Waze has as a street. Um, but there's two more types in OSM that don't really make sense from the in the ways world. If you if you keep that comparison for, if you if you keep that comparison for a while, for a little bit, um, the trunk and the unclassified they don't really have an equivalent. Um, for trunk, I don't really want to um, go into that for this talk because there's a lot of discussion happens basically every six months in OSM, at least in the US, about what is a trunk road, what isn't a trunk road. And I've participated in those discussions. Countless hours have been spent um, debating that. Um, and people are currently actually coming up with really good proposals about resolving this, uh, the, the unclarity around trunk roads in the US. But I wanted to focus today on unclassified because it's much less talked about and it annoys me that it exists. <laughs> 
unclassified, the definition is all wrong, right? It's um, it, uh, the dictionary definition is it doesn't belong to a class. That's what unclassified literally means. However, if you look on the wiki in OSM, it says the value unclassified is a classification. So that's already a clear sign that we don't really know as an OSM community what what to do, uh, what it what it is and what it isn't. It means a minor road, yeah, sure. A residential road is a minor road also. Um, what's more, they look the same. A classified and residential look exactly the same if you look at the map. Uh, you can see it in this pretty uh, diagram, but you can also see it in the real live map where if you, if you look at this little bit of map, half of these about are residential, but the other half are unclassified. Can't tell the difference. Well, that's to me a clear sign that we don't really know that there is a difference. Um, there's all kinds of definitions, like there should be houses, etc. But to me, that's all pretty minor stuff. So that's very cool, Smarty Pants. What do you propose instead um, if we don't have unclassified? Well, I think I already alluded to it. I think we should just kind of combine unclassified and residential to a simple highway equals street for every road that's not motorway, trunk, primary, secondary, or tertiary. I don't think it's too late to take action on this. There's never there's never, been, never been a greater time to solve this once and for all. Let's just use highway equals street and uh, and forget about highway equals unclassified and residential and that difference. I think it's the way to go. And um, I want to thank you for hearing me out. I know it's a difficult topic, but I think it's an important one. Uh, I hope you enjoy the state of the map and um, hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Bye. Hello, my name is Pavel Zbytowski, and I would like to tell you about my dream. It's a dream about integrated OpenStreetMap experience. You can think of Google Maps just with OSM data. All started in 2009, when I downloaded free maps for Garmin for my trip to the sea. I was surprised that there was missing a gas station there, and I was even more surprised when I found out that I can add it. This is a rapid incline, and a year later I created the first version of OSM app. Judge for yourself. <laughs> it was more of a prototype, but the idea began to materialize. For my mapping seminars, I made a website that had a sleepy map instead of background. It was just for fun, but this fun eventually became the map application for Czech community. It was in January 2016. I released the first version of my dream. It was a website with a CMS that had a simple map application instead of a background. This project was very well received by the Czech community and it continues to be expanded by several people, me included. Nowadays the app has a rich layer switcher. It also connects to a PhotoDB called Fody, which currently stores about 20,000 photos, mainly in Czechia. We also developed the so-called active layer, which was able to serve tiled geojsons for our country. And this was ideologically a kind of a seed for the OSM app. A year later, I started playing with the idea of fully integrated map application, and the first OSM app wireframes were created. Back then, still under the codename OSMCZ version 2. Next year, I explored Mapbox GL and created a design in the Figma app. It was a still long journey to go. Just the last year, I thought that the application was ripe for publication. Some parts worked quite well, but it turned out that leaving several buttons inactive was so confusing for the users. And this brings us to the June this year. The application has matured and implementation of the edit feature was particularly hard. But it makes me very happy to use it, and I hope it will make you happy too. So what can it actually do? It's probably the best time for a demo. So let's say uh, I have a, a one boy, which is called Sauna Hadovka. Okay, it's here. And let's say I need to add a telephone number for it. And just let's add it. As you can see, I'm not lo locked into the <laughs> not locked into the uh, OpenStreetMap, so um, this will create just a node. But if I log in, 
I'm already logged in, so I just authorized this application. I can save it directly to OSM. And it is done. And telephone number is here. It's left on OSM. As you can see, this is the edit I made today. We can also show the waymark trails and even rotate the map. So these are all the features it has. We have shown just a few of them. You can check it out later in the PDF. Okay, this is for the, those of you who speak computerish. Uh, of course, I have to thank my friends at MapTiler who generously offered a plan for free. And the future? So far, the target audience is mappers who want to use their data on PC. But I would also like to bring it closer to the ordinary users. Particularly, it will be necessary to rework the info panel, similarly as AD Editor does. In next version, I also want to enhance the layer switcher, add more clickable things, add directions, and of course, all contributions, ideas, and issues are, are welcomed. As you probably know, the community has a great power. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>